Hello, Bible readers. It really cannot be overestimated how important it is to remember that the Psalms were not originally written in English. And that might sound like silly obvious, but by not knowing Hebrew, by not reading this in Hebrew, by reading Psalms from a translation that requires, as every translation does, interpretation, we're just going to miss stuff. There's going to be stuff that goes over our heads or just truly gets lost in translation. For example, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zion, Het, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samech, Ayan, Pe, Tzara, Kof, Resh, Shin, Tav. That is the ancient Hebrew alphabet. And pronunciation of the letters I've pronounced since I took Hebrew uh, at seminary for two semesters 24 years ago, so I'm certain I butchered a couple of the letters and how you're supposed to say them. But Dr. Luker, my Hebrew professor, is certainly not watching this post. I mean, like 100% he's not watching. So anyway, uh, the reason I read uh, through the alphabet, and I did have to read the words because uh, I don't have them all remembered, um, is to, number one, remind you that the Psalms are in Hebrew, written in Hebrew originally, which means they have a Hebrew personality as every language reflects and shapes its culture, right? It both reflects it and shapes it. But also, number two, the second reason I did that just now is if you counted with me the letters I just recited, you got to 22. Well, guess how many verses there are in Psalm 25? 22 exactly. If we read a poem or a prayer that was originally written in English and each line started with the next letter of the alphabet starting with A and got to Z, I wonder what the Q line would be. But anyway, we would notice that that's what the poem was doing. And that would speak something to us, noticing that. So, this is why you're doing a deep dive with me, to notice what you couldn't possibly know without reading a commentary or putting yourself through these posts. And thank you for doing so, by the way. So Psalm 25 is another of these psalms that are written in an acrostic form. And I've spoken of this in a previous post. Doing this, just like in English or any language, when you do something like an acrostic, it just makes the the flow, it's just a little more disjointed. It doesn't flow quite the same as a Psalm 22 or a Psalm 23. When, when you have to squeeze whatever you're trying to say next into a line that has to start with the next letter, right? Remember, though, the point of using the acrostic form, it's not to, like, handicap the poet. It's meant to offer another layer of meaning to the psalm. It's meant to offer like an A to Z amount of wisdom or understanding on the theme or the themes that this psalm's trying to get across. So it's a way that a psalm becomes instructional, really. You know, you remember the, it's like a mnemonic device, right? You remember the A line and the B line and the C line. So according to my Brueggemann Bellinger commentary, I'm just going to pull this up um, you know, you probably have noticed I say Brueggemann Bellinger commentary in almost every post because if anyone ever just saw one of these posts, I want to make sure no one ever finishes any post thinking that I'm pretending to have all the insight, right? I have some of my own thoughts, of course, and I certainly am sharing my own stories and my own experiences of the Psalms, but the hardcore academic stuff it's all rooted in, or just plain old quoted from, that new Cambridge Bible commentary written by Walter Brueggemann and William Bellinger Jr. Well, according to them, there are five themes in the acrostic Psalm 25. Number one, the speaker is in a dire emergency. That's a theme sown throughout the psalm. Dire emergency, but completely relies on God's ability and willingness to rescue him right? It's not dire emergency and ah, it's, it's dire emergency and complete confidence. The watchword for the psalmist's confidence 
is that the psalmist waits for God. Waits is mentioned three times. He says this in verses 3 and 5 and again in verse 21. It's not an impatient, come on, kind of waiting as much as it is eager, longing, confident expectation, the kind of waiting uh, Christians do in the season of Advent as we wait for Christmas. The second theme is God's steadfast love, that it is the grounds for the psalmist's hope. This is a, a continuation of, that's a kind of a continuing theme throughout the first book of Psalms, isn't it? Stead, God's steadfast love. The third theme is, yes, the psalmist is confident. Yes, God has steadfast love. But where the connection between the two comes is the speaker's devotion to God, his integrity, his righteousness. We, God and this psalmist, are in relationship. So how could this all end up but one way? The way God promises, right? That's, that's the theme that I'm talking about, that third theme. The fourth is that this psalmist does not only speak of his righteousness, he also admits to imperfections, waywardness, which this is an interesting and uncommon, atypical, especially in this first book of Psalms, theme to have. In verses 7, 8, 11, and 18, he names ways he has failed at faith as though and this is an important piece to me, as though faith failures are a part of faith itself, a part of the relationship with God. As Brueggemann says, a declaration of integrity and a confession of sin can both be present in a life of faith, according to this psalm and lots of other parts of the Bible. Finally, the fifth theme and it's connected to the fourth, as much as the psalmist says, I am righteous and I fail sometimes, each behavior elicits a response from God that is consistently steadfast love. For the faithful, God promises protection. And when we fail, for the failed, God promises grace to restore the relationship. So either way, the psalmist is counting on God's faithfulness, because that is steadfast, right? doesn't sound like a very fair relationship that humans might stick with God only sometimes, but other times cheat, lie, or steal against God and God's people, but that God only remains faithful to us. There is a mismatch there, but that idea that God is steady and true at all times and all places, even when we are not either steady or true. That's the hallmark of biblical faith. Pretty much every story in the Bible fits into Psalm 25's teachings. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us, at all times and in all places.